Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility. This is episode 21, and we are talking today about how to turn your life upside down and make that big life-changing decision. We're going to be talking with our guests, Katie and John, and thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to the show, Let's Talk Possibility, where we talk about what is and even possibly could be possible in the world today with you, our listeners and viewers, and our interesting guests each week. I'm your host, Talana, and with me is co-host, Chris. Hey, everybody. And tonight we have our guest, Katie Andrews of NOAA, here in Johannesburg with us, and we have John Neve, um, who's a coach all the way down in Cape Town, who's joining us on Hi, Skype. Hi, everybody. Yeah, and we were just... Um, Tonight we wanted to explore about how we make those difficult life-changing decisions. You know, sometimes life just comes along and gives you a kick and you, you just know you have to make a big change that is going to just remember, you know, the implications are just so big it's going to affect your whole life. Or you're just not happy where you are. You know, the only way you're going to make this, a change and get to, to enjoy life more is to make that big, big decision that will lead to big changes that's going to impact the people around you and just literally turn your world upside down that kind of space where you you just know that we, you just can't continue as is yeah something has to and yet it's it's so difficult to make that decision and then just to implement it to take the the steps with that so Katie we know you work now for for Noah which is um just Nurturing Orphans of AIDS for Humanity. Yeah, so it's an NGO. Yeah. But before that, you were actually in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. And something happened for you, and you made that big decision to, to move from your lovely corporate job into an NGO position. Um, mm. How did that decision come about? Yeah. Well, I don't think it was instantaneous as, as your quick decisions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Not spare of the moment. It was something that had been bubbling in me for a really long time. Um, and at the time when the implementation was due to take place, there would just so happen to be an offer at an NGO that I really, really, um, that inspired me, something that I could see myself working with, something that had goals and, and a mindset that I'd always been thinking. And it was exactly that, just saying, I can't do this anymore. My real calling is um, I want to look after children. I want to be part of the change that I want to see in South Africa. And I can't sit back and just watch others do it. So um, it, it wasn't actually a long decision. It was a weekend decision. I was um, offered the job on the Friday, the official position, when I actually knew what my salary was going to be and um, what those implications were. And that was the biggest um, decision for me, was money versus my passion. So how was I going to live, knowing that my salary would be capped and um, there is no growth potential when it comes to earning money. There are a lot of goals and dreams that I would have to part with in order to, um, to take up the whole decision. And I thought about it for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And on Sunday night, I phoned the NGO and said, take me on, I'm ready. <laughs> so, cool story. You, you said, the, you know, the bu bubbling was such a great word. I think describing mm. that feeling that we have yeah, in, inside of us. Mm. Is it, was it more like an intuition or a nagging voice of doubt? Or how would you describe that in a bit more detail? Yeah, I think uh, it was a nagging. It was, I think the best way to sum it up is a calling. It's just something that you can't place. You, can't, you don't know where it's coming from. It's just there inside of you. And it's just, you know, it's knocking on your brain all the time and saying, mm -hmm. what are you doing? What are you doing? Come to yeah. this side. Come to this side. And, and that's really what it was. It was just a, a calling to do what I knew was right for me. And... Um, Something that would make me sleep easier at night. Mm. And I guess uh, there's a bunch uh, of people. Katie, I was just, I was just thinking um, the bubbling and the knocking on the brain thing is such a lovely metaphor, and I think that is what it, it's. It's something that is is actually coming from within. It's something inside that uh, that we often don't listen to mm. that allows us to really consider making change. And that bubbling actually does happen whether we know it or not all mm. the time. And Sometimes we have to stop, be quiet, be silent, be with ourselves to hear that and not get caught up in the, in the external rush of things. Yeah, yeah. 
So, so Kelly, so you had that, that bubbling then. Um, it sounds like you, you were trying to listen to that, the, the in, internal calling, as, mm. as John's saying. Did you actively go out then and look for something, or did this just come no. across your path and then you decided? You know what happened? I think this bubbling has been around since I was probably six years old. And it was, you know, it was something I'd always, I'd always wanted to be in this space. And then, you know, growing up and a teenager and um, trying to find what I really wanted to do, um, I come from a family of lawyers and I studied law originally. I went straight into varsity and at one stage I was going to do legal aid in North Africa and then thought, no, geez, I want the bucks. And... Um, I started working part-time and went into wedding coordination and then eventually left Varsity altogether to um, pursue my corporate career or chase the dream of earning as much money as I possibly could. And from wedding coordination, it went to special events. From special events, I went into sales and I was really chasing um, you know, as much money as I was earning and further and beyond. And, but I still, you know, that knocking continued and the bubbling continued until um, I was doing a lot of volunteer work in the year that I made the decision. And um, so I was going out and into field work and on weekends, after work. I just thought, well, why aren't you doing this all the time? This is what really makes you happy. Um, mm -hmm. And you've earned, you've earned a lot of money now. And um, you know, it's not fulfilling any of those needs that you thought that it would. Yeah. So um, yeah, and then actually the decision came to me. It wasn't that I went out and I looked for, for the job. It just so mm -hmm. happened that two very close people to me at the time were with Noah and they contacted me and I obviously conveyed my interest and that was you know that wasn't actually once off that Friday it was a couple of weeks before and you know we spoke about it and we went backwards and forwards and then it was that Friday where they said okay right this is the salary this is what you'll be doing and then suddenly you just go <gasps> Wow, this is it. <laughs> you know, this is it. You know, this that's it. Yeah. there goes the yeah. Prada and what the Gucci. What I've been talking about yeah. is actually come to me now. And yeah, that trip to Italy wow. is not going to happen. Yeah, you yeah. mentioned Katie when we were first speaking that one of your dreams was going to uh, spend some time in Italy, mm. and you mentioned that as a result of taking on this position, that that dream would have to be at least put on hold for a while. That's it. Yeah, I think that's it. I don't think you ever give up on your the dreams that you had before. I just think you realize that there's a, a shift in goals for the moment. So you just have to put everything on the side and focus on, on your life choice at that moment and go with that and just see where it takes you. Perhaps a sort so. of a change in priority, well, especially that's exactly in, the, in the short yeah. term. I think that, you know, that's exactly where you realize it more is when I look, when I'm at one of our resource centers and I'm looking into those kids' eyes or I'm, I'm just being with them and they're around me, I think, God, this is better than any country in the world could ever offer me. Yeah. And I think that's really the, where I know I made the right decision because nothing, there is no greater feeling than the feeling of knowing that, you know, you're mm -hmm. doing something for these kids, that every little bit of hardship you go through is for them. So how can yeah. Italy be such a big deal? So it's very much yes. around the, the meaning that then that you're getting in your day to day John will work. Be with you now. Mm. So, so John, I wanted to ask you, and then I know you've got a yeah. point to make, but but you do a lot of work then with, with your clients that you coach and the, and the groups that you facilitate, mm. and specifically around mm. them, um, and you know I think it's the creative expression that that you call it. But yeah, how much? I, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. I was going to ask you just how much of that babbling we've been talking about it is actually uh, like our search for meaning. I think most of our search for meaning is is that um, it's interesting that we look we we use the term looking for meaning or trying to find meaning. I think a more accurate one is that we make meaning um, through mm -hmm. through our choices, through our changes we make, and some. Uh, Katie's just. Uh, expressed it very beautifully in terms of her listening to the bubbling, listening to the knocking, and that coming from within, and then noticing that from the outside, from the external side, things started to come to her. There's mm. meaningful coincidence, synchronicity starts yes, to yes. happen, and you find yourself at the right place, the right time. But unless one makes that decision, it, it can't really happen because you're not opening yourself to it. And there's another lovely thing that Katie said, and that is that she noticed how much she's been nurtured internally, not externally, not because she's now got more money or more friends or whatever, but there's something about what she's doing 
that is nurturing her from inside. And I think that's the key thing that uh, is about making meaning with one's life and making meaning in the sense of connecting with others that are also doing that or longing to do that. We've been speaking, uh, the word meaning has come up quite a few times over the last uh, couple of minutes. Uh, Viktor Frankl, who was one of the survivors of Auschwitz, wrote a book, mm -hmm. Man's Search for Meaning. And in the mm -hmm. book, he says that it is a peculiarity of man that he cannot survive but for the future. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, he describes how, how uh, many of the survivors of Auschwitz survived because they had such a strong focus on, on what for mm -hmm. them was meaningful. And perhaps it's very relevant in the discussion we're having now. Yeah, so, exactly, so. Chris. If I could just add that in that instance, that's how he survived. He was writing a book about this very thing, about making meaning. And that's, that's how he managed to survive. And those that didn't have uh, or couldn't find any meaning to make in their lives, um, they, they actually didn't make it. Sure. Or didn't make the, yeah, yeah. get out of the prison of war camp. Alive. Perhaps one last point about uh, the meaning. Uh, one of the things that Viktor Frankl describes is that they were able to save many lives by helping these people to find the meaning in their lives. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's uh, also an, an important point to make tonight because we're asking the question, what, what really can help you to save your own life, perhaps? And it might be making that big decision, which leads you, like in Katie's instance, into a job that, that where you feel you're making a difference, which is bringing more meaning into your mm. your experience of life. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. you don't wake up one day and go, "I wish I'd made other decisions." Yeah. <laughs> I wish I did. I wish yeah. I'd. Yeah. And it, and I think it's also about a connection with the inner self. You know, uh, one gets pulled out of yourself often through um, wanting to either please somebody or, or find uh, a way of being in the world. And that listening to the inner self is such an important thing in terms of this idea of making meaning or finding meaning or hearing the bubbling within. It's like there's a river flowing within us and we have to stop sometimes to be able to to be with that and to understand what it means to us individually and then to bring that into our lives. And just one last point, and that is that Katie said when she was six years old, she actually knew. And I think that is the case often with us, is that we know at that early age what it is we want to do with our lives. And then, of course, we get pulled out of, out of that um, understanding or early understanding through having to try and fulfill sometimes our parents' as wishes for ourselves, etc. Societies, yeah. Mm. So, so I hear what, um, John, you've said a lot, is it's starting to just a bit of quiet time to connect with that, that inner bubbling as yeah. we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, I, I seem to hear a lot of people that make a lot of excuses. I mean, I gave the example before, you know, we, when we were getting prepping and that how I make the uh, decisions very quickly, but I know a lot of people don't always, I mean, that's just my style, but... Mm -hmm. What 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 are some of the reasons or the excuses that people use to to not make a decision that they know they really need to? I mean, it's coming from inside. It's bubbling. It's it's nagging mm -hmm. them. Well, I think fear is is a major kind of influence in terms of following one's heart. Let's call it that. Um, and following the heart is is never an easy thing. I don't think yeah. because it does mean you have to make sacrifices. It does mean sometimes suffering. And, uh, and if, the, if the nurturing that happens is felt inwardly, then the external suffering is, can be tolerated. And that's what uh, I think Chris was saying about Viktor Frankl, uh, that he was able to endure the suffering and overcome the fear. And I think that the, um, the key to overcoming fear is to, is to go within. You're not going to find a... a a, um, a solution to your fears uh, outside yourself. You actually, it doesn't matter how much security you surround yourself with or, or friends or people or whatever you need, you think you need. Uh, I think it is an internal thing and that being, it needs a, it needs a stillness. It, it needs a place of quietness to hear that uh, bubbling. Yeah. I, like, I love the, the idea of the bubbling. I think, 
I think a lot of people also <laughs> just, just use like the circumstances. So, I mean, you were, Katie, in a situation where, where you could um, sound like you were financially in a place where you could take a, a risk, if you can call it that. But a lot of people use, oh, and I can't afford to, you know, take mm. a lock in salary because mm. I've got my car to pay for, my house to pay mm. for, and the kids to send to school and, and you know, the clothes, bills and the food. And, and they just like, it's almost like they don't want to r- rattle the status quo. Mm. So, so to me, this is what we're trying to talk about is how, how people who are in that, that situation with, yes, the, how do you overcome that fear? How do you mm. change the status quo? So, so like almost I, wanna, I suppose what we're trying to get to now is what, what helps us make that big decision. Mm. 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 Katie, you were going to yeah. say something? Just leading on to that point, I think, you know, my decision was quite simple in that I was single. You know, I was young. It was, you know, there weren't too many obstacles in my way. So the decision was a lot easier for me. And I'm just, you know, while you've been talking, I'm just thinking of others that the ramifications of their decisions are so much greater mm. than just them and pleasing themselves and um, what's happening mm. inside. Exactly, John, like you were saying about um, the suffering that t- could take place or yeah. the hardships that others might have to go through because of your decision. So I think that's where it, it's really difficult for some people to make a decision like that because it's yeah. not just for themselves. The decision yeah. is has a domino effect and will you know, have Absolutely. impact on other people's lives. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that's you know, very scary. If I could just say, we're in South Africa, and this country had a, an amazing experience of making a decision to change the way things were prior mm-hmm. to 1994. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and, and fear came up. All kinds of things came up. Yes. And yet there was a, fa- a faith, let's call it a faith in the human um, being, Mm, uh, that we could do it and that overcame the fear and and I think you know some of the ingredients were a willingness to be open-minded open-hearted to listen to others to be able to consider what it means to be in somebody else's shoes and and so collectively that uh, that was uh, an incredible incredible time and an incredible change uh, and, and a decision made so what, what what we can take that in, into our own lives is is maybe it's it's about talking to the people that your decision will impact yes and and coming up with a way that that we can you know you can manage it with those those mm. people and maybe it's um you know yes. s- small steps small stages of of making a change like, like your son like over a weekend <laughs> yeah <laughs> but but it was there were less people involved and mm. what I particularly liked about what uh, in fact all three points had been made is, in, in Katie, in your side of things, you were taking the action of, of getting involved in social work. Um, John, if I've understood correctly from what you were saying, you've taken the action of mm-hmm. taking the time to reflect and to mm-hmm. possibly start to jot down some ideas, start to think about mm-hmm. what the different possibilities mm-hmm. are, mm-hmm. because at least then we are open, we're opening ourselves up to, to possibility. Um, and you know, on a... A quote that I particularly like, which is written by a guy called Joel Arthur Barker, says that vision without action is merely a dream, but that action without vision is just a waste of time. Vision with action can change the world. And so we talk about dreaming, but we do need to sit down and, and, and get something on paper or get some kind of relationship or some kind of discussion started. Yes. Yes, and I think the embedding, uh, the embedding the change. It, it, you know, what's one thing saying, look, I want to change, and making a decision to change. It's another thing sustaining it, and I think that's what um, we're talking about. That there are people in our lives that see things differently to the way we see things. So we have a perception, we have a perspective. And it really is important, I think, in, in instances where one is wanting to make life-changing decisions that we actually invite the perspective of different people that are close to us and that know us and receive that with an open mind, open heart, and so forth, and then uh, uh, look at how the change can happen. Katie, one thing that struck me when, when we were talking before the show was your conviction um, and, and your stickability within, within Noah, if we can use that word. Um, the other thing that really struck me was your, your discussion around 
some of the your your you know, being aware of, of some of the things that are that, that we're scared of or perhaps fearful or we experience after making decisions. Mm. I think um yeah, you know, at the moment, I think, you know, even after you've made the decision for the first three months after I'd made this decision to move over, probably the worst three months of my life, I thought, what have you done? <laughs> you know, it, it's not only the parameters of my, um, my physical life that was changed, it's the environment that's changed too. You know, things mm. are completely different in an NGO compared to, you know, you don't have a stapler, for instance. You can't staple your paper together or the printer breaks and you can't phone someone to come and fix it. You know, just things that you were so used to working suddenly don't work anymore. And, um, and it's adjusting to that, getting used to that. And uh, So the first three months were painful. They were very difficult. Like that change, I thought, you're really like, what have you done? This is crazy. You know, you just can't do this. And then suddenly, you know, I got used to not having a stapler and kick the printer when it wasn't working and you just get on with it. Yeah. So what, what sustained you in those three months then? It was conviction. It was knowing yeah. that I made the decision for a reason and you can't outweigh 18 years of a belief versus three months of mm. difficulty. Mm. Like it was hard, and, but I knew it was going to be hard. I think someone once said to me about another big decision that I'd made and when I went back to them and said, oh, God, that was awful. Why did you let me do that? And he just looked at me and said, no one said it was going to be easy. Mm. You know, and yeah. I think you take the good with the bad and nothing is going to be a walk in the park. It's interesting yeah. that you use the word belief there. Um, if you look at the, the, con the, the definition of conviction, it, it uh, is the state of being convinced uh, or a strong persuasion or belief. And perhaps the more we spend time reflecting or listening to that inner tapping or however we want to call it, um, mm -hmm. the stronger that belief is, and the mm -hmm. easier it is to to over the, the easier it will become to overcome the the difficulties that we yeah. face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I think also, Katie, you, um, you know what you were saying earlier. It's sometimes just you look into the eye of somebody that you're working with, and you just see the the depth of what you're doing, mm -hmm. and and that in and of itself is such an amazingly. Um, energizing and, and confirming thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. I think just to go back to those three months as well, it's now been two and a half years. And if you ask me now if I would have changed my decision, absolutely not. And if you ask yeah. me what corporate was like two and a half years ago, I have no idea. Mm. Like there is no other life that I could replace now with this one. Mm. This is, and, that and decision that was worth it. So it was worth it, but also, but, and that's what we're saying, these life-changing decisions literally turn your life 180 degrees. Mm. You know, mm. you, you, you end up in, because it's not just like work-related. So, so obviously, Katie, you've, you, thank you for sharing your story because you, you're mm. helping us, you know, to unpack this. Mm. But this could be people who are deciding to get married or divorced. Absolutely. It's yeah. people who are um, deciding to start a family or adopt a child or... Mm -hmm. um, give up everything, go traveling for a couple of years or stop that and actually go and get a job. You know, it's something that, that, that literally, it's just moving the opposite countries. of, yeah, moving countries and mm. moving cities, even house. For mm. some people, it's, you know, moving houses is a moving big thing. Moving out of thing. home. <laughs> yeah, so, so all the, those different things. So what I'm hearing is, is it's about speaking to the people that that decision will impact and obviously the one person you speak to the most is yourself. <laughs> Um, yeah. But but spending the time to listen to what it is that you really really want and believe, so that you're having the the conviction in your beliefs that that is what you're about, mm. and needing needing to do it, um, f doing something that they, that will bring you more meaning. I mean, I think we do as as humans, especially if we've got our basics kind of needs met, and we've been nurtured, as said, and we, we're now in a position where we can we can make these these kind of changes. Perhaps but one of yes, yeah. you're going to say. Perhaps one of the, the, the issues that I, I've heard many times before is I can't do it because of whatever. And we discussed excuses earlier. But perhaps it's, very, it's worth looking at uh, or considering um, a, a model that was written in the, in the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, yes. which is the circle of influence and circle of control model. The, the circle of influence being those things that we can actually do something about. Whereas the circle of uh, concern, concern being yeah. the issues that, w that, are, that are problematic for us or, or important for us, mm. but that we don't actually have, mm. can't actually do anything about it. Um, mm. And it seems to be that what we've talked about earlier, which is 
being being active and, and getting results is around focusing on that which we are able to impact. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and for me, it's, it's about that um, realization that the locus of control is actually within rather than outside of you. Um, and that sounds like a big kind of statement, but it, it, in fact, often we, we ask somebody else outside us to help us make a decision. But I think what we hear in what happened with Katie is she sat with it, she listened to the bubbling, she made the decision. It was, it was something that she took within her and owned that. And then, um, Absolutely. obviously, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then looked at what, what she could do. So, so it sounds like, you know, Katie, you, d just to unpack that model a bit more, you have a concern for the children of the future. And, you know, because, for example, what, why did you decide to go out of corporate into NOAA and not into, I don't know, saving SBCA. trees? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Or um, some other kind of job? Mm. It was, you know, it was always going to be something to do with children. And, um, you know, that's my passion. Those are the people that I find that, to me, are the future, future of this country. They're the future of me. They're my children's future, are the children right now. So unless we actively do something, all of us together, um, you know, the problem is not going to go away. So, you know, there are 3.7 million orphans in the country. If I was to stay in corporate, I might live a pretty comfortable life myself. But what about those kids? Yeah. And I think that's also the conviction um, to make Absolutely. the decision is you can't mm. sit back and watch it happen. Yeah. You actually need to do yeah. something. And then your circle of concern is obviously the 3.2 million children that you've spoken about. But mm -hmm. you, you actually, you yourself cannot impact 3.2. Oh, no. But the way you can make a dent into that is to look at your circle of influence. So it was using the skills you've got. Because it sounds like the, your position mm. now within NOAA is using a lot mm. of your selling skills, your event management and that to help know to, to do what they need to do, which is impacting yeah. the however many hundreds of thousands of kids that they are mm. looking after. So that, that I find interesting is understanding that, you know, that here you have your concern, which is massive, but how can you within that circle of concern, what is your circle of influence within that? What yeah. are you able to do in your way with your skills and abilities mm. to do your little bit to contribute to that, that greater? Mm. I think that's yeah. one of the things as well, you know, we get debriefed about in the, in this overwhelming situation is, is to unpack it and just to say, you mm. know, that is a problem, but there's nothing exactly what you mentioned earlier. There's nothing you can do about those 3.7 million, but you can mm. do something mm. about the 20,000 that are in your care. So focus on that. Mm. So if your decision is incredibly overwhelming and something you need to do, break it down into its mm. smaller compartments mm. and you will see that perhaps the, the overall decision is not as giant as you thought it was if you just looked at it in its, sure. its little bits and pieces. And simply just mm -hmm. by, by listening to what you're saying about 20,000 children, that just astounds me and <laughs> overwhelms me. But perhaps, John, just using, uh, look, looking at a different scale, the, the half an hour that you were mentioning earlier is certainly within your locus of control. And yes. um, we can make that time available simply to reflect mm -hmm. and, to, and to think about what it is we want and how we can get there. Yes. Yes, and I think it's, it's that compassionate as well that's so important or the passion that Katie is talking about and it's interesting that the root of the word passion is also the root of the word suffering and uh, it's, it's so important I think for us to really find what that passion is and try and bring that into the world individually um, and as Katie says uh, you know one can touch that many lives but I've been inspired by listening to Katie, and, and in fact, that's what it's about. You know, you inspire others through expressing and living your passion. And, and I think that that uh, stall time is such an important thing to discover that, because the bubbling inside is about the passion. The knocking on the brain thing is about the passion, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Got a catchphrase going. <laughs> Got a catchphrase yeah, going. I'll sell it to you, John. <laughs> Just, uh, it's funny we use the word uh, tapping, and it might be a little bit off the off the topic. And I know we need to start closing down. But uh, Lawrence <coughs> van der Post wrote a book called "A Story Like the Wind," and in the book um, were, were two bushmen um, who are, who are some of the, the sort of the, the main characters. 
and and this uh, the one that sort of male character talks about his his tapping inside. So it's interesting mm. across cultures and across uh, backgrounds we have a similar mm. word to describe this this thing that's within us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to end, I want to tell you one story because I actually worked with Lawrence von Post in a filmmake at wow. home once. And uh, he, after the war, he'd come back, after, and his war had extended over a, a year longer than, than was normal because he'd been asked to stay on in Java and help rehabilitate, rehabilitate the people. And when he came back, he went to Pafuri, which was right at the top of the Kruger National Park, and he felt that he wanted to just shack, get shacked the, the chains of war that he felt were on him. And he walked in, he was walking into the solitude of nature, and he walked into this fever tree grove. And as he was standing there, he looked up to his right as if something drew him there. And there was this kudu bull, which had come out of the, uh, out of the trees, and it looked at him. And it lifted its head and it sniffed the air and it came back down and it looked at him again. And he said when, he, when that happened, he knew it was his decision he could return back to his people and go back into the world again because it was almost as if all those chains of the wall had fallen away. So it's that kind of synchronistic thing that we need to be aware of in life. Mm. Mm, what a wonderful yeah. story. So yes, I'm definitely I think some of the themes out of this discussion, Ron, is, is listening to that that internal voice bubbling, tapping, whatever, and then following it. So so allowing yeah. yourself to dream about what could you possibly um, do if you don't know, if you don't know what what. But sometimes I think we we have an internal knowing of what decision we we need to make. Maybe we just don't know how to implement it. But then it's asking the people around us for their support and and taking and the time to sit for a while. And, and often. And, and, yeah. yeah, and that small tap tapping voice that Chris was talking about, which the the sand people talk about, is is in fact the small still voice within, which is mm. as old as we know it. It's spoken about often in different ways, but it, there is that small still voice, and to hear it, we have to actually still ourselves, sit by the yeah. river, in the internal river, so to speak. And then it's saying, notice the synchronistic events because things then start crossing your path, like there's opportunities and, and talk to people and then, and then you'll be surprised. You might get the offer of the dream job or whatever it is and then have the, you know, the opportunity to and make that life-changing decision. And Deepak Chopra said, if you want to understand if synchronicity is telling you to make a decision to change, just notice it coming to you three different times. So you're thinking of some uh, change in a phone the phone rings and you're walking down the street again and you look around and you see exactly what you've been thinking about. And if it happens yes, three, three times, times, it means, yes, There's change is on. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, if, if someone wants to get hold of you, John, um, Sorry. I know if someone wants to get hold of you from the show, we've got your, your email address yes, on. Yeah, sure, email address or, or my cell number. I'm very happy to take calls um, on my landline number, yeah. So just I'm for those that are listening, it's jneve at telcomsa.net. Um, all right. the details of, of our guests and their profiles are, are on, on our show notes and on our blog. And Katie, if people want to find out more about Noah... They can go to our website, which yeah. is www.noahorphans.org.za um, or follow us on Twitter, which is Noah underscore community. Cool, and they can get, you, they get can, hold of you through that. Or they can contact yeah. me directly. My Twitter handle is Katie minus one. Very intuitive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, <laughs> or they can email me at katie at noahorphans.org.za. Okay. Just to be sure, Noah, N-O-A-H. Yes. Like Noah and the Ark. Great. Yeah. Well, I look forward to getting hold of you, Katie. I'm very excited about what you're up to, and I think it's brilliant. Thanks, John. It's a lot very close to my heart. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, um, our next show again will be next Monday at Hopper 7. Um, we'd love you to join in and ask us questions. And for our guests, we're actually talking about positivity next week. Positivity. It should be quite interesting. Tomorrow ah. is, the, is the Let's Talk Sports show. But yeah, we are. We'd love to to keep talking about making decisions with you. So if you have any comments to make or questions to ask, we can keep the discussion going. Find us on our Facebook page, or you can tweet us on LT Possibility. 
But yeah, I suppose until then, enjoy making some decisions in your life. Take, you know, take the courage and, and go make them. Make things happen, guys.